Hello and welcome to a live panel discussion co-hosted by Independent Rx and the Independent Pharmacy Cooperative. Now today's webinar, How to Read and Use Financial Statements to Improve Your Pharmacy Business. This is the fourth installment in a four-part series that we're bringing you here in 2022 to help you grow on the business side of your pharmacy. Now I'm Brandon Bormans, Marketing Program Manager with IPC. And my role with the company is to develop and contribute to marketing and communication initiatives that help educate and empower member pharmacies and attract new ones. Now, my role today will be to moderate this, uh, what we feel is a very important discussion on using those financial statements that maybe you'd rather not look at sometimes because it might be confusing or intimidating to your advantage. Now, today's experts might be familiar faces to you at this point, especially if you joined us for our most recent joint webinar back in September. Once again, we are fortunate enough fortunate enough to have Owen Bondurant, partner and owner of Independent Rx, along with Rich Danoff and Jim Sunderland, both of whom are CPAs with Independent Rx. Gentlemen, welcome and please go ahead and kind of reintroduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, thanks, Brandon. My name is Rich Danoff and yeah, I'm a partner here at, uh, at IRX uh, along with Jim and Owen and my background I was in public accounting, one of the big firms, for several years. Then I was in a large corporate tech um, uh, business for 10 years doing mergers and acquisitions and such, and, and got introduced to pharmacy about 15, 16 years ago um, through an independent pharmacy owner who had multiple stores, Tim Clark, who's also a partner here. And we became partners, so I got into ownership in pharmacy about 16 years ago, and we started buying star pharmacies, opening pharmacies, expanding, you know, the pharmacy group that we had. And that was my introduction to pharmacy. So I've um, been, been doing it for quite some time now. Again, I'm a CPA, so I'm on the financial and the accounting side of the business. Uh, you know, our business, uh, we've kind of transitioned from owning pharmacies, although we still have a couple pharmacies, to primarily helping people operate, own and operate pharmacies as well as start, buy, or sell pharmacies. I'm Jim Sunderland. Uh, I'm the Director of Accounting and Tax here at IRX. Um, I go way back. I started off in a national accounting firm, worked there for about 10 years. And uh, from that time, I worked in uh, several different industries uh, around the area, um, served as CFO for about the last 20 years in uh, my, all my uh, uh, companies I worked for. I came here about three years ago uh, and enjoying every minute of it, learning all this tax stuff. So, And I'm Owen Bondurant. I am not a CPA. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually have a marketing um, degree, but uh, I'm one of the partners in the company as well. And um, a lot of my background is um, I'm one of the owners in the pharmacies we own now. Uh, and um, I deal a lot with helping people start by sell pharmacies. So um, I'm here today just to kind of bring another, you know, non-accounting perspective of, okay, they said this, what does that mean to um, people who aren't an accountant? <laughs> well, Owen, that makes two of us. <laughs> you and I can team up. <laughs> so to get this conversation going, um, you know, we're talking about financial statements. Which financial statements are we going to be talking about today? Can you go ahead and kind of set the table for us? Yeah, I think think a good little foundation, right? Foundational knowledge of what we're talking about. So when we're talking about financial statements, I think most people are familiar with balance sheet, profit and loss, or an income statement, and statement of cash flows make up your, your financial statements. So, you know, just a little... You know, as you look at a balance sheet, a balance sheet is a, is a point in time, right? It's recording uh, your position in something at a point in time. It could be an asset that you have ownership of. A simple asset would be cash. How much cash do you have today? It's going to change from today to tomorrow. So it is that at that very moment in time, what is on your balance sheet? You have cash. You have accounts receivable. You have inventory. You have fixed assets. So those are assets. Those are things that you own are sitting on your balance sheet and the value of those, those items that you own. And then there's the second section is liabilities on your, on your balance sheet. And liabilities are what you owe, how much you owe somebody. You've borrowed money. You borrow, you've got an SBA loan to buy your pharmacy. So you, you owe a bank for the, uh, for, um, 
for purchasing your pharmacy. You may have payroll, you have employees that have worked and you have not yet paid them. You know, your, the pay period ended on Sunday, they don't get paid till Thursday. You have a liability to those employees for the four or five days that you have not yet paid them. So liabilities are what you owe to people, you owe for your utility bill, you owe your wholesaler. And then the final section on the balance sheet is equity. So equity is what you've put into it and what the business has earned or lost over the, over the course of time. So if I'm putting my initial uh, cash into the business and I put $100,000 in, then I've got $100,000 of equity. If I take a distribution and I pull $20,000 out, now I've got $80,000 of equity. As the company makes money, that also gets closed out into equity. So your equity goes up and down with the money that you put in, the money that you take out, or the earnings of the business. And that's the equity section. And it's called a balance sheet because you take assets are going to be equal to liabilities plus equity. Everything that you have, either you borrowed money to get it, or the company made money, or you put money in to, to be able to acquire it, right? So that's the basic balance sheet. And you said point in time. So what you're saying by that is the balance sheet changes literally every day. So you have an inventory of 150 today, you buy inventory tomorrow. Well, now you have more inventory. Right. So but tomorrow your balance sheet changes, right? Yes, but you typically report that on maybe a monthly basis, right. especially on an annual basis, and usually at the end of a month. So you're showing, okay, here's what it was. And you know, you look at your balance sheets between, you know, maybe at the beginning of the year, end of the year, and you can kind of see the or the see the changes at that time between, you know, the periods. Yeah, but so basically just keep in mind that that like Owen just said and, and Jim the balance sheet changes every day throughout the day. But when you take that snapshot, that is what you own, and that's how you've acquired it. You've either the company's made money, you put money in, or you borrowed money to get it. The one that we typically refer to and what people jump to first is, is the profit and loss or the income statement, right? And unlike the balance sheet where you're looking at a point in time, a profit and loss or a P&L covers a period of time. It could be a week. It's typically a month, a quarter, a year. So it is all the activity of the business over that period of time. And so when you look at a, at a, at a P&L, it's going to start with your revenue, right? You're going to have, here's the revenue that the business has earned. And then you're going to have cost of goods. And in pharmacy, cost of goods is basically the cost of drugs. So you're taking the revenue that you're earned, the cost of goods for those drugs, and you're getting to a gross margin. So revenue less cost of goods. So the revenue that it generated, the cost of those drugs, and hopefully we're looking at a positive gross margin. As you know, when you look at a particular script, sometimes you have a negative gross margin on a script. You paid more for a drug than you're actually getting re reimbursed by the PBMs. But hopefully overall, you know, typically we'll see, you know, an 18 to 20% gross margin on retail, right? So, so you've got your revenue, your cost of goods brings you to your gross profit. And then from your gross profit, you take out expenses. And the, the, the most prominent expense is typically payroll, right? You've got employees. And so you've got your employees, but you also have pharmacy supplies like vials and lids and so forth. So you, you've got, you know, um, expenses for your pharmacy system. So you're paying, you know, fees for your pharmacy system. You're paying other, you're paying insurance, you're paying bank fees, you're paying payroll fees, you're, You've got all these expenses. That, Advertising, right, rent, rent. Yep, marketing, rent. Rent's always a big one. So all those are kind of lumped together in what we call expenses. And then you take your gross profit, you back out your expenses, and you get to your operating profit. And that's where we're looking at the performance of the store. And then there's a final section, which is non-operating. And that's typically interest on the debt that you've got outstanding. It could be a change in accounting. Um, it could be a one-time, like an insurance claim that is non-repeating. That's not really part of the operations of the business. It could be the gain on the sale of a, of a delivery vehicle or something like that that would be unusual in nature and not repeating and not really the essence of the business. And once you back those out, then you get to the net income of the business. And that's, that's what a P&L is. Right. You know, then, then the last piece of the financials would be the statement of cash flows. Uh, especially in an accrual basis, kind of takes you through the cash flow that you get from operating activities, 
finance activities and investing activities. So it kind of comes down and, and shows you the total cash flow that's been provided by it, uh, you know, the, the company, and then takes that and adds it to what the beginning cash was to get to the ending cash. So it's kind of a reconciliation of cash from that standpoint. And really important on an accrual basis financials. Yeah, I, I can't say in, in probably 150 stores that we've looked at over the years and gotten the financials, how often have you seen a cash flow statement? Like twice, right? Yeah. I mean, people kind of ignore the cash flow statement. Um, and it, there's a reason for that because it's a little that. complicated to understand. Yeah, so you is. don't see a lot of cash flow. Again, cash flow takes an accrual based accounting and converts it from accrual to cash. So it's trying to reconcile what happened in the cash from the beginning of the period to the end of period. Where did the cash go? So that's what a cash flow statement has done. Again, we rarely see them when we see financial statements. Right, it's, it's a typical gap financial statement, but in this realm, it's not used as much, definitely. So between those two, cash and accrual, which does IRX provide or lean more toward and why? Yeah, and that's, you know, again, another foundational thing is you're looking at, okay, now we understand a little bit about a balance sheet, we understand a little bit about, about an income statement, but they can mean totally different things depending on the method of accounting, right? And, and so we hear this all the time from clients, you know, are we cash, are we accrual, should I be accrual? So um, accrual, and, and we'll just give a couple examples. So accrual is all about matching. So that's the primary, it's about matching. It's about matching revenue and their expenses in the same period. So the easiest example is when you are dispensing a drug, right? So if you have a customer come into your store to pick up a prescription, you are handing that vial across the counter to the patient and they're walking out the door. At that point in time, you are either collecting cash at the register or billing the third party or both. And you are taking inventory off your shelf and sending it out the door. And there's the matching. So if 30 pills go out the door, at that point in time, you are recognizing the revenue, right? And you're recognizing the expense of those 30 pills that went out the door. Now, if you were on cash, on strictly cash basis accounting, the difference would be, hey, I bought that bottle of 100 count bottle of pills, you know, three weeks ago. So under cash, when that cash left your um, store or what left your bank, that's when the cost was recognized. So we recognized cost three weeks ago for a hundred count bottle of pills because we paid our wholesaler for it. Now the patient comes in, picks up 30 of them, walks out the door. It's all billed to third party. I'm going to get paid in three weeks. I'm not going to recognize the revenue until the the third party pays me and that hits the bank account. So again, think about the bank account and the coming and going of cash. When bills hit your bank account is when you're recognizing the cost. When revenue or income comes into your bank account is when we're recognizing the revenue. So in the cash basis of accounting, there's a real separation sometimes between when you pay for something and when you get paid. And again, we, 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 we um, deducted the entire amount of the 100 count bottle in that case. But in accrual accounting, it's all getting matched up to the point of dispensing. Mm -hmm. So two very different you know, takes on, the, on how you account for it. And, and so at the point of dispense, again, think we're only recognizing the cost of 30 of those and we're recognizing the revenue, even though we haven't received any payment yet, or as cash, it's, it's creating separation. Right. And it's really showing there when you have the cash basis financials, all of this based on cash, really what, you know, what's happening with your cash and every cash transaction, how is that reported? Is it revenue? Is it cost? And you're reporting it in those buckets in the income statement. Uh, and that's how you're tracking really all that. I think one of the things we always say is, you know, cash doesn't lie. So, you know, the cash is what it is, and uh, you know, record it accordingly based on what the transaction was. And as a non, like accountant, you know what what you see is is you know 
a lot of times you'll look at your profit and loss statement and it'll say you made money. And then you go to your bank account and you're like, I didn't make that much money. And the reason may be that, for example, you had three payrolls in that month, right? But in an accrual basis, it, it, you didn't actually, it didn't leak like it, it, it's getting moved into another month or it's only part of that payroll is in that month. Um, maybe you had an extra wholesale bill. So if you pay your wholesale bill every week, you know, sometimes you'll have five wholesale bills. And so your cash looks lower than what your actual margin is in accrual. So like, you know, I know as me as an, an, an owner, I'll be like, well, geez, I mean, like, we didn't make month, we didn't make that much money. And it's like, okay, well, that's because there's a difference between cash and accrual. And that could potentially catch up you know, the following month, and it may flip-flop, you may actually have more cash than what your p and is, is. So people are always like, I don't understand why my cash goes like this, but my p and is always kind of flat. And we hear that all the time. Um, and the reason being is that matching principle versus cash when things occur. And the matching is trying to get a smoothing effect on the p and right? It's trying to say in a particular month, it's trying to associate the expenses used to generate revenue. And, and so th there is a smoothing effect that generally occurs in um, when you do uh, accrual-based accounting. And, and so in a month, you're going to have 30 days worth of payroll, whether you pay 30 days worth of payroll or not. You're going to have 30 days worth of payroll in that period. And we get a lot, a lot of questions, you know, well, I, I went to a seminar or I talked to this person and they said, you know, I have to use accrual. Well, you know, there are reasons that, that we generally prefer cash. And so if, you know, in public companies, right, in our background, everything's accrual, right? You're, right. you're SEC registered, you've got, you know, audits, you've got bank covenants, you've got all these requirements to be gap-based accounting or a full accrual compliant accounting. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, that's really in, in bigger companies like that. And like you said, with the bank covenants and everything, that's, you know, gap is the basis that everyone wants to report on because that's kind of the requirements you have to meet. Um, it doesn't necessarily follow what the cash actually is happening. That's just showing actually what your income is because we talked before, you know, you're matching those revenues and expenses and the period cost into what period it relates to and not when you made the cash expenditure or when you've actually received the cash. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about why we prefer cash, right? And and how it relates to pharmacies. So first of all, pharmacies, small independent businesses, 99% of us are not required to do, to do gap-based accounting. Unless you've got some unusual bank covenants, you, you're not doing required to do back gap-based accounting. So that opens up the door for cash, as long as you're under 25 million in revenue annually. Mm -hmm. um, you can do cash basis accounting. And first of all, nobody does pure cash, right? Right. It seems like it's always a hybrid because, you know, a lot of times when you're recording this cash things, it's one thing to not have receivables and payables, but, you know, you bought a fixed asset. That's an, actually an asset you bought and you want to show that on the ink, on the balance sheet as an asset, uh, just like when you've got a payable or when you've got debt, you've received the cash for that, or you have bought something for that debt you want to show that debt on the balance sheet at the same time. That's where you get kind of a mixture of, uh, you know, the, the hybrid or, you know, cash and accrual basis, so to speak. But here's, here's the frustrating part, right? And it, it, we'd probably all be doing accrual if certain things were, were easier in, in pharmacy. And the challenge is inventory. And you guys all run your pharmacy systems. Keeping your inventory accurate in your pharmacy system is challenging and there's lots of reasons for that. You're buying from primary wholesaler, you're probably buying from secondaries. Is your, are you bringing your, you know, when, you, when those purchases are coming in, a lot of times pharmacy systems will try to put the primary wholesaler cost to a secondary purchase. You're doing returns, is it handling returns correctly? There are rebates that you're not gonna get paid for sometimes months that are gonna reduce those costs. How do you handle those? So. And, DIR fees, reversals. Yeah, and there's just all, all kinds of crazy stuff that happens Rebates. in your inventory 
that screws up your inventory. It, it might cost your, you know, you might buy a cream and it might cost it by the gram versus by the package. And all of a sudden your inventory's screwed up. Well, guess what? If your inventory screwed up, then your cost of goods are screw, screwed up. And if your cost of goods are screwed up, then your margins and your net income are screwed up, right? So we spent years, and believe me, in 16 years, battling with this, what's coming off our store's um, pharmacy system in terms of reports that we're then using to book our entries for, um, for inventory and cost of goods. And y y we would spend so much time trying to figure out what was right and not right and how to fix these things, and they would never really match. And it would cause our margins to really fluctuate because of that. And, and so at some point we said, you know, we really need to look at this from a cash viewpoint because we know, as Jim said, the cash doesn't lie. So if I can break free from having to use pharmacy system reports to do my financial statements, and that's what cash basis basically does, it says, I don't care what your pharmacy system says is an inventory. I know that you paid your wholesaler X, you paid your secondaries this amount, and this is the revenue that was paid to you by your, by your um, third parties and, and cash and copays at the register. It, it gives you the freedom to have now two disparaging pieces of information, one of which is your financial statements, which are based on the coming and going of cash from your, from your bank account. And, and there's, that is accurate. It's telling you exactly what's happening in your bank account. So the cash basis financial statements are accurate and there's no, but you still don't of kind of the accrual or the matching side, but guess what? You can run your firm at the end of the month and, and you can run a pharmacy system summary report and it'll tell you, I filled 5,000 scripts this month. Here's the revenue associated with those 5,000 scripts and here's the cost. So now we've got kind of the accrual coming off the pharmacy system and we've got the cash. And if the pharmacy system is screwed up and our inventories aren't right, I still know that my financials are correct on a cash basis. So that's, that's kind of the yeah. foundation on why we chose to, to run on cash. And cash just becomes more easily understood and interpretable from a business owner standpoint. And if I was in person here, I'd be probably asking the question like, share, show a raise of hands of how many of you get a financial that says 17%. And you're like, I know that I keep a separate spreadsheet and I know I ran it 20%. Well, here's why, is that you can't ever get it to match properly due to rebates and DIR fees and, um, you know, reversals, audits. I mean, there's just all this stuff that can like <laughs> cause your revenue and cost of goods to kind of switch around. Um, you know, your EDI fee to your system is wrong. You don't have any data on your secondaries. You pay your secondaries on 45 days versus two weeks on your wholesaler. There's just all this stuff that's moving and it causes your margins to be, it's very difficult to get it to match in pharmacy. Whereas cash, you know, you, you, you collect it and you buy it. Like that's real. Um, now that doesn't mean you should ignore your inventory and your AR Absolutely. and all these other things. Like, but you need to pull that out of your reconciliation system out of your pharmacy system, as Rich was saying. So this is why you sometimes probably don't trust your financial is because it's almost impossible to get it to match. And, and keep in mind, we run pharmacies and we still couldn't get it to match. Like, yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> so yeah. Which I think you know, so. We hear too that, um, you know, pharmacies when they go to conferences are, are, are told and implored, oh, you have to do a cool base. So it's really interesting for someone who's, you know, not in the weeds to hear um, the argument for the counter to that. And it sounds like you have had a lot of success with your clients and your pharmacies um, doing cash base. Yeah, it really seems like, you know, we found, especially in this industry, just based on the size of the companies, it's, it's so efficient to be able to do these cash basis financial statements. And it really shows you what's happening with your cash and it alleviates really the need for any cash flow statement per se, because between the balance sheet and income statement, you're really seeing what's happening with the cash, where it's going, et cetera. And then we provide them a dashboard with all the other data, their pharmacy system data, so they can see that accrual stuff. 
the inventory, the accounts receivable, what are their rebates, like all that data they still have, it's not ignored. It's just that we're giving them two pieces of data. And, and I can't tell you how often I speak to someone that says, oh, well, I keep piece, two pieces of data anyways. Yeah. Like they, they pull Excel spreadsheets and they're doing this concept anyways. They either are getting an accrual financial and then tracking cash or they've got cash and they're tracking this thing in Excel. So they're already doing this concept. Um, and, and where this came from actually is our partner, Tim, was always like, well, did my cash go up or down? Like, which one did it do? <laughs> and, and it sounds crazy, but like yeah. it, for him, it was that simple. Like I either literally made money or I did not. Uh, and so yeah. that's what, you know, a lot of owners want to know. And so cash financial helps you do that easily. This might be taking just a step back, but could you talk a little bit more about the basics of just simply reading the financial statements. I heard all three of you mention a PL um, a lot. Um, can, can you go through that a little bit? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think we've kind of laid some foundation. And again, it's important to understand the financial statements. And then it's really important to know whether you're looking at cash or accrual basis financial statements, right? Because they tell you different stories. And like we said, you know, cash can fluctuate greatly from day to day. You might get a payment from a third party, like your CVS Caremark payment might come in, your cash goes way up. Your payroll and your McKesson payment goes out, your cash goes way down. So you do have to look at cash over a period of time. But, you know, the first thing people want to talk about is jump into the P&L, right? Right. And, and it, it does, it is the one that's telling you whether you're making money or not. But as Jim and I were talking about, in, in, in our background back in the day in public accounting, um, we were on the audit side. And the first thing the auditors look at, and, and basically when an auditor comes in um, to look at your books and to verify your books, they're going to go straight to the balance sheet. And the reason is, is that the balance sheet items are verifiable, right? Your, your cash is what it is, right? So we can verify, we can check against a bank balance at a particular day and determine, is that number correct? You know, receivables, inventory, fixed assets, debt, um, payables, all those things are verifiable by testing. So we like to encourage people, before you dive into the P&L, take a look at your balance sheet. Make sure it's right. And make sure it's right, right? Because if your inventories, I mean, we see so often people look at a PL and and say, wow, I'm, you know, my margins are going up. I was doing 20 and now I'm doing 24. Now I'm doing 28. And we see 28% margins. We're like, have you looked at your balance sheet? And what do you see on the balance sheet? Well, you see inventories going up, right? Inventories were 100. Now they're 180. Now they're 250. Now they're 300. Well, all that cost is getting held up on your balance sheet, right? And, and so instead of flushing through cost of goods sold, and bringing your, your gross margins back down, you're just seeing inventory climb. And if I were to do a physical inventory today, I might not have 300 and sitting in my inventory, I might have 140, right? And then that difference has to then to fix the balance sheet, guess what, you gotta push it through the P&L. So, you know, look at the balance sheet and make sure that you understand what's on the balance sheet and, and understand whether those items on the balance sheet are reasonably correct. Right. That's what's going to affect. I mean, any of those changes, there's really kind of work in tandem and, you know, change the balance sheet, like Rich said, in the inventory is going to affect the cost of sales and that's going to affect your P&L and the bottom line there. So that's one big thing to look at first, you know, versus just going straight to the P&L. But then when you are at the P&L and you're comfortable with that, I mean, there's really in pharmacies, we're looking at three big items uh, that kind of dominate the P&L, so to speak, you know, being your revenue, what you sold your, your scripts for, the cost of those, and payroll. Those are really the three biggest things. And you get a lot of information out of that because you want to look at your revenue minus your cost of sales, which is your gross margin, and look at how is your margin doing. You know, if your margin's not enough to cover the rest of your expenses, then you're going to have issues there. And that's one thing you really want to focus on. And another would be your payroll. If your payroll is too high, then you're, you're going to have, you know, you're consuming too much cost in your payroll, which is also going to drive your bottom line down and make your financials less, you know, uh, less favorable. 
you really focus on a lot of those two areas, that's going to do a, a lot to understanding what's going on in your business and what you can do to try to, you know, fix things or make things better, make improvements on your company based on looking at the P&L from that standpoint. And to expand on that, I mean, the reason that we focus on those three things and, you know, when you look at a P&L, those are the three things you want to make sure are in line. Um, because if you think about it, you know, an average independent pharmacy does, I think, NCPA says, it says like 3.3 million. Well, 1% movement in revenue across a year is what, 30 some thousand, either up or down. That's a, like, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, same with cost of goods, right? So your inventory in a typical retail is going to be 87, 80, 82% of your cost. So if that goes up or down by 1%, I mean, it's a lot of money. It might be more than all your other expenses combined in a month, right? So like it's, there's a lot of up and down and then payroll, if, if you've ever put a percentage of sales out to the side of all your expenses, payroll will be more than all the other expenses combined. So again, a 1% movement in payroll, you know, either up or down can make a drastic impact in your, your profitability and your cash. Right. Um, so, you know, those are the first three places. If you don't have a handle on the revenue, the cost of goods and what's occurring with those, and then also your payroll, well, then you need to get a handle on those first yeah. and, and understand the trends and what's impacting those. Yeah. If you're not doing all three of those, not just any one, but yeah, if yeah, you're not doing yeah. all three of those, well, you're probably not making money. In pharmacy, right? You have to have the volume. You have to have the scripts coming in the door to drive the revenue, right? And then you got to be purchasing smart. You you can't just be sitting there without a contract, just buying everything from your primary wholesaler. You've got to make sure you've got the right contract in place. You got to make sure you're using that 10% or maybe even ignoring your contract and rebates completely and buying all your generics on the secondary market. But you've got to figure out what works for you for the particular mix of business that you have coming in the door. So you've got to get that purchasing right. And you got to spend the time to make sure you're doing that. So you can't buy too much of inventory either. Right. Because then all your money is sitting on the shelf rather than in your pocket. Right. Um, so you've got to keep those down and then payroll, you know, again, it's 10, I mean, it's your biggest expense. So you, you, you know, we, we, <laughs> we say often that your people are your biggest asset. They're who are interfacing with your customers. They're really important, but they're also your biggest expense. And so you, you got to manage that balance really well. You got to, and in today's environment, that's getting harder too, because, you know, with, with inflation, you know, the, the cost of that labor is increasing. And so, you know, we usually see, you know, if you're an average store, you know, three and a half million or more, and you're doing straight up retail, we see, you know, payroll, we like to get it as close to 10% or lower as possible. We see it 16, 17%, and that's all payroll, including benefits and payroll taxes and all things. Now, if you're doing compounding, so if, if you, those, first of all, those people are more expensive, but those are also 75% gross margins, right? Whereas a typical retail store has an 18% plus or minus gross margin. The compounding store has a 75% margin. So a lot of their you know, sometimes a hybrid store might have 29% payroll to revenue ratios, whereas a straight up retail store will have, you know, a 10, 12%. Regardless of the type of store, you know, if you can figure out how to run more efficiently and run with 1% less payroll, well, it's again, your biggest expense and how you are more profitable, right? Yeah, we're not saying that obviously rents and, and marketing expenses and all those things, but you typically negotiate a rent once every three to five years, right? And then it is what it is. Um, so those things are still important and you got to watch them, but don't spend all your time worrying about your utility bills when, you know, you're not purchasing as best you can because you can save a whole lot more money and bring, you know, a lot more to the bottom line by purchasing correctly than you can by adjusting your thermostat. You certainly, you certainly work with and help, uh, help a lot of pharmacies. What are some of the other documents and systems that you use when you're evaluating a pharmacy's performance? I was just going to mention, I mean, you know, we talked about P&L, but 
you know, the balance sheet too, we talked about making sure that, you know, we're comfortable with that and everything that's on there. But, you know, when you're reading your balance sheet, you want to, you know, look at what your cash balance is at that point in time, when you know what all your assets are that you have on there. If you're a accrual basis, you're going to have receivables on there. But in our system, usually we don't have, you know, we're cash basis. You don't have uh, receivables on there, but you still have your fixed assets and your other intangibles. And the important thing is, on the liability side, the debt, what's your debt balance? You know, what's happening on that? If you look at a, uh, two balance sheets between maybe beginning into the year, what's happened to your debt balance during the year? Has it increased? Did we take out new loans? What's the balance of that now? And then when you get to the equity portion, that really gives you a good feel for what's happened from that standpoint of, you know, what's my net asset or, you know, how much do I actually own here? Uh, net, how it's increased with our income, what money I've taken out, et cetera. So it's important to look at that too from the financial statement standpoint. And then as a segue into gets into other systems we would look at too. Yeah, some of the other systems and documents, obviously our financial statements that we've been talking about are, are a key piece of it, but our pharmacy system is a key piece to it, right? It's giving us information on, you know, prescription summaries, how many scripts we're filling. It's doing that accrual for us. If we're doing cash-based financial, it's doing the matching for us of scripts and their cost. Um, you have a payroll system. You're probably running payroll every couple of weeks. So those are recorded as entries on your financial statements, but the payroll system is telling you how many technician hours did you have in your store this, this uh, pay period, how many driver hours, how many, how much overtime, all those different breakdowns. So there's information coming off the payroll system. You know, we've got tax returns um, that, you know, do your tax returns match up to your financials? So um, are they, they tell them the same story right. so that do they reconcile that just, or, um, you know, you, you've got reconciliation. So as Jim mentioned, accounts receivable, accounts receivable and a cash basis financials are not a line item on your, on your balance sheet, but you have a login to your reconciliation service, right? Log into your reconciliation service and make sure that that's updated and that that's being kept current and that checks that are coming into the store and not going through electronic 835s are getting marked off in your reconciliation service so that when you look at your reconciliation, you can say, hey, third parties at this point in time today owe me you know, $200,000. And you can know what that receivables balance is and that it's not, that you're not missing checks and not getting paid for things. So like Jim said, just because we don't have a line item on the P&L for accounts receivable doesn't mean we ignore it and don't have visibility to it. We get into our reconciliation, we manage our reconciliation. It's just that we're not rec relying on a reconciliation to make our financial statements, right? I think right. what they're trying to say here is that the profit and loss statement and the balance sheet, they are a guide. They are not the end all be all, right? So if you see your payroll going up, you need to go to your payroll system and go, okay, did I have a lot of overtime? Did um, I go on vacation and had to pay a pharmacist? So I paid, you know, myself and the pharmacist. Like what is driving these trends up? If my revenue is declining, did my generic and brand mix change? Did my script count go down? Did a payer stop paying as well? Like what is driving it? They, and p and is supposed to show you kind of, okay, where do I need to go look to improve my business or spot an opportunity for even that matter? So you've got to have supplemental um, things like the payroll system, your pharmacy system, you know, maybe even your wholesaler and buying group rebate, you know, statements mm -hmm. so that you can see, you know, hey, why was my rebate lower this year or this month? Um, things like that. So you do need to supplement it. You know, the, again, the profit and loss statement gives you a guide and then it tells you where to go look. Right. Yeah, uh, it's almost like all subsystems together, really, you want to look at. Right. This is where you stand. One, one of my favorite exercises that I do with every client with our own financials is I look at the last four months, right? And, right. and I say, what's the average? What's my average revenue over the last four months? What are my average DIRs over the last four months? Um, you know, what are my what are my rebates? What are my costs? Look at, look at your line item. What's my, your rent should be what it is. Your payroll though can fluctuate because we're on the cash basis. When you look at a four month period and you average those last four months, you get a good feel 
that, you know, all the ups and downs are kind of working themselves out and you're getting a balance and you're looking at recency, right? You're not looking at 12 months ago. Like we're in November. We're not looking at what happened in January. We're looking at the last four months. So I like to look at the last four months. I like to look at an average and say, here's my revenue. Here's my cost. Here's my margins. And then here's my expenses. Am I making money? Is it, is it positive at the bottom of the thing? I hope it is. Um, and if not, you know, you know, where are my problem points? And it, again, it's probably going to be one of those three. Either I just have to flat out get more business. I can't lower my payroll beyond what it is because I've got a pharmacist and maybe one tech. I've got to go drive more business if that's the case. Or, you know, my margins are, are running 13, 14%. Maybe I've got a ton of brand business, but you got to figure out how to buy better to try to get your margins up, right? To cover those expenses. So that four month period average is what I generally look at. And then, you know, take that to project forward as to where that, where we think that's going to fall. Right. One question that um, we get uh, with some of our members, I think Jimmy might've touched on this. So my apologies. I might, this might be asking to kind of uh, restate or just sort of refresh, but what, one question we commonly get is what effect do, do debt payments have on my financials? Well, a lot of times people see debt payments and they, they expect to see that in the P&L. But, you know, debt is on your books on the balance sheet. And uh, when you make a debt payment, typically there's a portion of that that's interest and a portion of that that's principal. So what happens when you make a debt payment is your cash is going to go down to show that's the payment we made. Your, the principal portion of debt is going to go down on the balance sheet, and then the income statement is going to reflect the interest portion of that payment. So when you see a debt, a debt payment, the only portion you're really going to see in the income statement is the interest portion of that. So when you, when you think about debt, you got to, and you're looking at your profit and loss statement, and go down at the bottom and it says other, what do we call it? Other uh, non-operating expenses. Non-operating expenses you have a profit well that doesn't show your principal it's not showing the principal of only uh, showing that so if you made two grand and your principal's two grand you really made zero cash wise yeah. cash wise so just keep that you know and again that's kind of under a modified cash basis that where, is, you, where yeah. you truly have debt on the books right so yeah that split between um paying off the, the debt itself, so reducing cash and reducing debt over on the balance sheet, and the interest hitting the P&L. So, and, and that's where cash is going out the door, but it's not reflected in the PL, P&L, and it's also not deductible for tax purposes, right? That, that reduction of debt is the portion, so it reduces your cash, but you're not actually getting a deduction for it, and that's... Yeah, and one thing I was going to use one yeah. thing just made me think here is also is that I mean, we do have cash, modified cash accrual. And when you're talking to your accountant, you may want to talk to your accountant about how they're doing things to make sure you know, like, what are the movements? What is here? What is there? So that you properly read this. Um, so it, it's not a bad conversation to spend, you know, a half. it's not rocket science, you guys. So like spend a half hour with your accountant and, you know, have them make sure that they explain how they record things and do things. Uh, yeah, debt, yeah, debt payments can be a little tricky to people yeah. because they, they do not show up on the P&L. And similarly, um, distributions, right? If you're, take, if you're distributing out of your company, those aren't going to show up on the P&L either. Right. Payroll, if you're paying yourself and you're an S-corp and you're paying yourself salary, that's showing up on the P&L as salary. If you're taking distributions, it's reducing your equity and it's reducing your cash. So it's a balance sheet only entry either. So that's another one that yeah. I think most people miss is the principal payments on the debt and the distributions are things that are hitting the balance sheet only. And not when you're looking at a P&L, you're not realizing that cash is also fl outflowing. Got a, uh, got a good question here from one of our attendees. And it is, where, where do DIR fees fall on the P&L or balance sheet? Okay. Yeah. That, and, and there are differing opinions on this, right? And we alluded to earlier that, you know, if you're a big publicly traded company, you're under gap requirements. And so there may be certain gap requirements, uh, but we're not subject to gap. So you have some leeway in how you want to record those. 
for us, when we see a DIR fee come across, and first of all, it's usually wrapped up in an EOB with other fees like statement fees and, and so forth that come with your EOB, right? Technically, a statement fee would be an expense, but we see DIR fees as a clawback of revenue, right? Because that's exactly what it is. It's saying, no, you didn't really make $95 at the register. You made $80. So we're taking two months to ask you for that money back, but we're taking it back two months later. So we take DIRs and reduce them and reduce your current revenue. So as the DIRs hit under a cash basis, we reduce the revenue from it. Similarly, on the cost side, when the rebates come in, we reduce the cost because those rebates are a reduction of your true cost of goods sold. So we reduce, so rebates fall under, um, under cost of goods sold, DIRs are a reduction of revenue. And while there might be some gray areas there, I mean, you know, we feel like that best represents where it really is in the pharmacy, uh, you know, where it should be shown. So you really know what is your actual revenue and what is your actual cost. And, and the thing that you got to be clear there is that we have DIR fees as a separate line as part of your total revenue. So, you know, it, it isn't just, hey, sales. Right. Not just right. And then you don't know if it was reduced or yeah. not. It's a separate line that actually reduces it. Same with rebates. We actually carve those out and put them as a separate line item under cost of goods sold. Right. So that's because, uh, again, you got to know. You got to know. Are my DIR fees running 2% or are they running 6.5%, right? We've seen both. So it just depends on who your payer mix is. And that's one of those things, you know, we also get a lot of, hey, how can my margins on my pharmacy system, you know, say 23% and then my cash basis financial statements say 17%. Why do I have this big disconnect? Right. And stuff like DIR fees is some of that, right? Yep. There's really no pharmacy system. I mean, there are pharmacy systems that can handle DIRs, but you've got to do all the work, right? You've got to identify the plan and you've got to keep adjusting and putting in the amounts that you think the DIRs or the percentages that the DIR. I haven't seen a pharmacy that does it and does it. I haven't even seen them really try. So <laughs> your pharmacy system generally does not have DIRs in it when it's calculating your gross margins, right? So whereas your financial statements, as we said, we see the when, when the DIR fees were deducting them. So they're reduced. So that's one reason. There's a there's a there's several others. I mean, um, yeah. you know, if if you're doing lots of, you know, it, your your pharmacy system might not have rebates built into the EID feeds. Um, so um, the rebate percentage is wrong. Or the rebate percentage is wrong, right? So if you're not getting feeds with, with rebates in them, then you're going to have a much lower margin in your pharmacy system than you are on your financial statements. So again, these are the kinds of things that you have to understand between the two systems when you're interpreting the data. But you should be able to, as you go, as you step through some of those items, make sure that your pharmacy system is telling you and your financials are telling you, you know, the right story. And if not, then some work needs to be done. Again, the cash doesn't lie. It's telling you the story, what's happening to your cash. The work needs to be done on the pharmacy system to get things more correct, to work with your technicians on how they're receiving orders, to make sure that they're breaking out secondaries at secondary pricing, not at primary pricing making sure they're handling the returns and the rebates and all that stuff correctly in your pharmacy system so that your pharmacy system, along with your financial statements, can tell you the overall picture of the health of your pharmacy. Another good question here from one of our attendees in the chat comes from Mr. Patel, and that is, should 10% of payroll include the owner's salary? If the owner is the pharmacist, Yes. If the owner is silent, I would say no, right? Um, and also the owner pharmacist, their work in, is getting paid like a, a normal pharmacist right. wage. I mean, if you're paying yourself 300000 then no. <laughs> right. You have to say, if I, stepped out of the, if I stepped out of the picture, would I have to hire somebody to do my job? And how much would I have to pay them to do that to get normalized payroll, right? You're really looking at normalized payroll when you're looking at a benchmark. So if you're overpaying yourself, if you're underpaying yourself, if you're not active in the store, but you've got payroll coming out, you have to adjust for all those things. But yeah, you're, you're trying to get to, 
to a normalized payroll for a normal store in your area with your market, you know, how much is that payroll as a percentage of my revenue? And that's retail only. Uh, yeah. You have again, other things, long-term care, compounding. If you're retail and you are heavy, heavy brand, you might have really high revenue, but sure. you're only filling 800 scripts, you know, a week, but you're heavy brand. So then that 10% doesn't apply so much. It should be lower, right? If you're heavy generic, you know, so there's a lot of, a lot of things to analyze there, but we like to look, you know, a typical balanced mix, 10 to 12% of revenue or less. Now, if I were a pharmacist, I would be looking for ways and wondering how to reduce my taxes. Um, do you have any tips or any guidance for, for those watching, listening today for, for reducing their taxes? Well, you know, one thing is, especially on the cash basis, you look at a couple of things. You, you want to try to defer revenue as much as possible because if that revenue doesn't quite come in at that time, you don't have to recognize it in that year. So if there's a way you can push that off just into the next month when you get to year end, that will help decrease your income and decrease your taxes because you've lowered your income by having less revenue. Another thing would be to accelerate expenses. If there's things you can pay for, you know, because your cash basis, you're going to get those expenses in the year. You want to pay those early. You know, pay, make sure you pay for those in the month when that uh, comes in. If you've got certain expenses that you maybe be paying in the first couple of weeks of January, pull that into December. You can take the deduction for it that year. You just have to remember that when you do that that year, then the next year, you're going to need to do that as well, or you're going to end up in the same situation. So it's kind of a thing we call you, you kind of kick the can down the road a little bit. You're, you're deferring the taxes, but that's kind of the name of the game. You want to defer, every year do something to try and defer it and, and push it on down the road because typically, you know, taxes, you're going to pay it eventually. It's just a matter of when you pay it. It's a, a lot of timing there. Also looking at um, any equipment purchases you need, you know, under the, the tax laws, especially right now, they're favorable to buying equipment and be able to write, you know, hundred percent of that off. It changes next year where it goes down 80% under certain depreciation rules. And there's always a section 179 depreciation as well. But if, if you've got equipment that you're looking at next year, uh, that you're going to buy and you've got the cash for it now, you uh, purchased it this year, you can take the deduction this year and get it into service. So that's another area we look at. Also, you know, we've got some, a lot of pharmacies, they make good money and they've been going along and, and they finally, everything's kind of clicked and now they're starting to make really good money. What do we do with all this? You know, one of it is, you know, is, is there certain retirement plans you can set up? Look at that to put money away for retirement, and then you defer that, that tax until you take the money out of retirement. So those are some big areas we try to look at to say, here's some things you can do uh, to, you know, to plan tax-wise to help divert some taxes. Yeah, this time of year, we're getting a lot of that, right? Because we're, we're going through all the financials, we're having conversations uh, with all our clients, and, and everybody wants the magic bullet, right? How do I reduce my taxes? What can I do? Don't you have any great deductions? But at the end of the day, if, if you have a tax liability, it, it probably means you had profit in your pharmacy, right? And, and, and that, that is the goal. So, and, and to Jim's point, I mean, we can kick the can down the road and there are some, some tools we can use to do that and to push the tax into next year or the following or even long-term down the road. Do we think tax rates are gonna be better next year or 20 years from now than they are today? So is that really a, <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm not paying the dollar out today and I can maybe earn some money in the meantime, but so there's deferral, which has its pluses and minuses, right? And then the other way to, to get rid of taxes is to, to lose more money or spend more, or, you know, you could give bonuses to your employees. It'll give you a tax deduction and you won't pay as much taxes and, and it's a benefit to your employees. But at, I guess at the end of the day- profit for you. Yeah. At the end of the day, you want your store to be profitable. And if your store is profitable, you're going to be paying some taxes on it. And it, it's just the way it is. Now, timing on that, you know, in, in some states, especially if you're if you're a high earner in California, you're paying, you know, 13 percent state tax plus 37 percent, you know, federal. So you're at 50 percent. So, yeah, we want to avoid those types of tax situations. But at the end of the day, if you're 
if you're paying 50% taxes in California, it means you're making a lot of money in your store and, that, and that's a positive thing. Yeah, we need to look at tax strategies, but getting out of paying those taxes, you know, at some point the bill is going to become due. Right. And I think there's well, a lot fellas, of- we are, we are, oh, go ahead, go ahead. A lot of conception I want to that. cut you off there. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of misconceptions about taxes because I think you read things online all the time about people not paying taxes or paying taxes. You know, you know all the wealthy never pay taxes. Well, they eventually pay the tax or they've invested in a business that's losing money that offsets what they're making or they've deferred it. Uh, given it you know, away. Yeah, and, and if you really read the articles, you know, they do pay <laughs> taxes yeah. at one point. And so, um, you know, I, I'm, we're not saying don't tax plan because you should tax plan and you should, but your tax planning should look at not just how do I pay less this year? What is my plan for the next couple of years or three years? Because like you might, uh, you know, it may be better to pay taxes now. Right. Um, so just, you know, look at the bigger picture when you're, when you're doing these things. And, you know, one way you can do that is to use your profit and loss statement to start building a budget and a plan for the following year, which may impact your tax decision. Um, so, yeah, you just have to be really careful because again, we kind of preach to everybody, you know, cash is king, right? And that's why we do the cash basis yeah. financial statements. We watch your cash carefully. If you're looking at deferring revenue and you're doing it by, you know, putting huge amounts into, you know, deferred comp plans or um, 401ks or, and sometimes you can put, but you're also losing access to that cash, right? So don't- For a long period of time. For a long period of time, and you can't access it without penalty. So you got to be careful before you step into some of those things and all at the, all at the, the cost of avoiding a tax. And I don't like paying taxes. I don't like paying, having our clients pay taxes, <laughs> but when they are, I at least know that they're paying taxes because there's profits in the store. So that's a good thing. Well, as we close in on the top of the hour, um, I wanted to give you three the opportunity to let our attendees know how they could get a hold of you if they would like to uh, reach out to you for your expertise and your guidance when it comes to reading financials and accounting. So the best way is go to our website, um, independentrxconsulting.com. Uh, uh, that give you all the info to, you can schedule a call on there, our phone number's on there. You can do an inquiry. Okay. Uh, we're also on all the social media, so we're quite active on social media and post a lot of stuff. So LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, whatever all of them are now. <laughs> we're on all. Right. <laughs> yeah, I talk to I talk to owners and and prospective owners every day. So I, if you want to reach out and ask some questions, um, you know, we can. We'll be more than happy to talk to you and and love to hear from you. No doubt. And um, for those in attendance who may be thinking, oh, boy, I, I, I have a colleague who might be interested in this content. Um, is this webinar going to be available uh, to watch on your website here soon, Owen? Yeah, yeah. We're recording this, and it will be posted on our site. I mean, give us a couple of days because we've got to probably edit it and make it where it can go on the website, but it'll be out there here shortly. And we'll blast an email and put it on social media as well. Oh, and just edit me out. Yeah, no problem. We'll, we'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> These three are the stars. These three are the stars. Well, thank you to you three for this great conversation. Um, a lot of our IPC members have a lot of questions about how to read financials and accounting. So this is, uh, this is really great for our members as well. And it's been great collaborating with Independent Rx throughout this year. And, uh, Looking forward to doing it again in 2023. Yeah, thanks, Brandon. I really appreciate uh, IPC and your, your support of us and, and, the, and doing these podcasts because it's been great. Yeah. Well, we have a long partnership, and it's going strong, and we'll continue. Absolutely. And thanks to all of you in attendance uh, today. We hope you have a great rest of the week and a happy and healthy Thanksgiving week next week. Take care. Thanks.